trying a case during the pandemic. In my ongoing series and deep dive into trials that occurred during the pandemic, I had an opportunity to interview Jamie Anzalone of the Anzalone Law Offices, who's based out in the eastern side of Pennsylvania. Now, Jamie handles all kinds of cases, in particular catastrophic cases and wrongful death matters. But like all true and great trial lawyers, he tries any case. Recently, Jamie had an opportunity to try a soft tissue motor vehicle case, cases that are, are notoriously difficult to win as plaintiffs in Bucks County, Pennsylvania during the pandemic. And he's going to share with us some of his takeaways and what his experience was like trying a case during the pandemic. So let's check it out. Uh, thanks for joining us on The Persuasive Lawyer today. I'm Brendan Lupitan, and today I am getting the, uh, the good fortune to interview uh, attorney Jamie Anzalone from the Anzalone Law Offices. And uh, Jamie is a stud personal injury uh, mm -hmm. a trial lawyer based out in Northeastern PA. He's been trying cases for a while now. I think he was, um, began practicing in 2006. Uh, he's got a whole slew of accomplishments. He focuses his practice on high-end personal injury, negligent security, medical malpractice, nursing home and products liability lawsuits. He's repeatedly been named to Pennsylvania uh, Rising Stars and more recently Super Lawyers Distinctions. He's a member of the Million Dollar and Multi-Million Dollar Advocates Forum, and that's limited to only those personal injuries that have secured seven-figure and multi-seven-figure settlements. And so not surprisingly, Jamie has had uh, several settlements in the past be listed in law.com's top Pennsylvania statewide settlements. And uh, Jamie is routinely asked to lecture and teach other lawyers about various aspects of personal injury topics. And in doing a little research, he's multifaceted, I see. He's also an accomplished musician, uh, was a star football athlete back in the day, and does a lot of uh, charitable um, work outside of the practice of law. And so I'm uh, super excited to have um, Jamie on the Persuasive Lawyer today. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for having me. That was a wonderful introduction. I was not expecting that. <laughs> oh, well, absolutely, man. When I read about you, I, I wanted to give you your uh, appropriate kudos and accolades. But, <laughs> you know, beyond my, uh, my bloviating, um, can you tell me a little bit more about, you know, your practice and and what you're most passionate about in the course of your practice these days. Well, again, thanks for having me. And uh, really, those are some very nice words. Uh, we're going to talk, funny enough, today about a case that has um, none of that excitement, really, about it uh, with million dollars and multi-million dollar cases. This is a very routine auto case we're about to talk about. Uh, but I think that that is what uh, makes this practice special, what, what we love to do. And that's really, we take cases really from all ends of the globe, all sides of the spectrum. Um, you know, we always pride ourselves in taking cases on referrals that, you know, could, could settle for $5,000, $7,000, because in our community where we live, Luzerne County, um, if you do well for a client at that level, uh, you see a lot of repeat customers and people who will spread that goodwill that you're doing for them uh, and you'll get a referral back. So, you know, we, we really do pride ourselves in taking uh, looks at cases that are or even on the lower end, but we're passionate uh, about a lot of nursing home work. That's a big part of our practice, trucking work, uh, medical malpractice, uh, and of course, auto cases uh, and everything in between. But we have, a, we have a good firm here, a good young firm. Uh, we have a lot of fun. And to go back to the point I, I thought you raised that's so important is that every case will be tried if necessary. So you take the smaller cases, the medium cases and the gigantic cases, but you know, you have to be prepared to try all the cases, I think. Um, and I just think it's a good thing to do all around. I mean, if you just bailed, if a case that wasn't as huge as the rest of your cases, you know, just cause you didn't want to be put out to go try it. Um, I just think that would be sending a bad message all around. So I give you a lot of credit for trying any kind of case. The smallest case literally is put together the same way the biggest one is. It's just the bigger one has more, you know, fancy stuff that you get to put in it. So yeah, I, that's, that's our philosophy. We're, but I think it's a great service too, because I think it's critical that people that um, have righteous cases, but maybe the damages aren't as significant. But you know, for instance, the accountability or the wrong is just as important to no uh, stand up for. I mean, it's great that that people can get 
you know, good representation from lawyers that are capable of handling all those cases rather than, you know, only lawyers that handle small cases and only lawyers that handle the big cases. So yep. I, I think it's great when I hear that uh, good lawyers and good firms are willing to try any case across the board. It was an auto case that happened in 2016, rear end accident, low speed. Um, and I had a lady who was in her 50s, who was a waitress, uh, who the alleged injuries were a C5-6 uh, radiculopathy, <clears throat> uh, a L5-S1 disc herniation, and that was really it. And it required um, uh, about two years of treatment, you know, a lot of chiropractic care, maybe 80 or so visits, a lot of physical therapy, uh, about three injections. Uh, but that was really it. There was no, and not to minimize that, that's, I would never want to go through all that, but in the world of personal injury cases and catastrophic injuries, it was not that, uh, but it was uh, a lot of treatment. Um, and we alleged that she needed future care, but again, low speed impact. And uh, their defense expert agreed that she has sustained a, at most a cervical sprain and strain, kind of a common defense, you know, position in cases like this. That would have taken a month or two months to get over. Uh, and we said that it was more than that. Uh, through our experts, it was the radiculopathy and the disc herniation. Did the court give you an opportunity to continue it or the other side to continue it? Or were they more adamant like, hey, guys, let's get this case going and try it no matter what? Right. So we had, um, it was a State Farm case. There's only $100,000 of coverage. Uh, my lady would have been happy to take 50. And I worked very hard to try to get 50. Uh, they offered... I think eight, nine, and then said they would never go more than 20. Uh, and I really just put it in her court. I said, you know, I think we could probably do better than this. I can't guarantee that we will, but it's up to you, completely up to you. And she, and she said, we have to go for it. Uh, at her age, I gave her the opportunity to also ask for a continuance. I said, look, uh, if you want to continue this because of COVID, I'm uh, happy to do so. Uh, that's your call. Certainly, you know, I'm 39 years old. I'm in good health. I'm not, the jury, the judge isn't going to buy that I could get a continuance because I'm worried about health. Uh, and certainly I wasn't going to be able to get a continuance because I thought there'd be an unfair jury. And I, Bucks County doesn't work that way that I knew that would never be successful. Uh, the defendant was a 21 year old girl who was pregnant. Uh, she was willing to go along with it. So there was really, there was no out on it, quite honestly, even though despite me having some reservations to say I don't know, this is going to be tough to get a verdict during this time period. But so uh, we definitely would have had a chance to ask for a continuance. But with my lady wanting to go ahead, I, there was really no good grounds for it. I guess, what was the thinking as far as you could tell from the court? Did they want to get jury trials up and running again? Or did they want to do it in a limited capacity? How was that working from, from what you could tell? I got the sense that uh, they wanted to get jury trials going again that were kind of these smaller cases. Um, they had tried one right before ours. Uh, so we were the second in that county when they started juries again. Was the one before you a civil case? Civil, auto. Uh, I think it may have went four days. Can you describe for us what the courthouse is like? I mean, in my experience, a lot of the, you know, sort of outlying uh, courthouses are usually surprisingly big and beautiful. Um, I don't know what this particular one was. What was the space situation like? It was a smaller courthouse, but it was very modern, um, way more modern than Luzerne County or any of the those rural counties that you see, those old big time buildings that are just beautiful or almost oversized for the area. Uh, but it didn't have that. It was a modern courthouse uh, with all the technology that you could ask for, uh, but, a, but a small courtroom, smaller than anything in our county. Each council table had microphones and technology to hook up into the PowerPoints, uh, whereas you just would never see that in the old courtrooms. So did the court in, say, the last pretrial conference before you actually went to trial um, tell you that uh, there were certain things that you were just going to have to do, uh, or there were certain rules that were going to be in place because of the pandemic? So when we, tr we everything was done by phone. So the first time I actually saw the judge was when we were ready to pick the jury. Um, the judge had asked us to try the case in front of six jurors, which I was okay with. In a smaller case like this, I, I think you have less people to convince, so I would have been happy to go in front of six. Uh, State Farm would not agree to that. Uh, they said they wanted 12. 
Uh, and the judge gave him a hard time about that and said that's unreasonable in, in the face of a pandemic. Uh, please let me know if you can compromise on this or else. Basically, he was, he was going to be upset if that was going to be their position. Uh, but of course, he couldn't make them try the case. That's with less than 12, but they agreed to eight. Any <laughs> alternates? So, with, so it was eight with no alternates. If I'm not mistaken, and I'm forgetting, I, I think he said if we lose two, uh, the Constitution allows you to try the case in front of six jurors. Uh, so uh, they would have, they would have, they would have still let the jury go out if there was only six. Sort of like a built-in alternate in a sense. Correct. Yeah, but there wasn't an official alternate. What um, was the veneer like? How many people did they bring in for you to select from? Not as many as I would have thought. Uh, again, smaller case, so maybe they thought it, we weren't going to have so many strikes for cause. Uh, but I know in Luzerne County, they're bringing in a lot more than they brought in here. I think we brought in 40 in this case, um, which is fine, except that I could have figured in my head that we would have had, you know, 20 people, 30 people who would have said, I don't feel comfortable sitting in this trial, but that wasn't the case. So the total veneer for you to select from that day was 40 people. Yeah, 40 or 45, maybe at the most. Uh, but knowing that we only had to get to eight, it wasn't so stressful. Uh, once we got through one or two of those first, you know, uh, people who can't sit because of hardship questions. I've seen in some of the, some of the counties that are, that are trying to try cases that, well, not even just because of the pandemic, but some counties in Pennsylvania send out a questionnaire ahead of time that among other things, you know, including demographic information allows jurors to uh, indicate if they have any hardships. Was, was there anything like that done out in Bucks? They had a, yeah, they had a questionnaire, but it wasn't anything before, you know, like a week before uh, the trial started. It was just the regular questionnaire they'd give them in any jury trial the morning of. Oh, okay. So they came in and yeah. filled it out that day. Yep. Got it. So the, there wasn't a way that the court could have preemptively addressed people that had COVID hardships before they got there. No. Okay. no. And frankly, I, I thought that if we had a bigger case and there was a couple of things that went the wrong way, this, we easily couldn't, we wouldn't have tried this case, but I think we actually just got lucky to be able to get jurors who were okay to sit. So where was the uh, jury selection process conducted in your trial? This courthouse, if I remember correctly, had three floors. The second floor was the jury lounge. Typically when they try cases there, I believe, Actually, I shouldn't say this. I, I, I've never, this is my first case ever trying in Bucks County. So I don't know if they normally would bring them up to the courtroom, which I think probably would have been tight even on regular circumstances. So we picked in the jury lounge, which was a room that was, um, it was big enough to have 40 people in there. Everybody was perfectly spaced six feet apart. Everybody was socially distanced, including us. Um, so yeah, that was, it was smaller than I would have expected, honestly. I mean, in Luzerne County, we're picking at the Jewish Community Center, which is, you know, an area that has a full basketball gym. Uh, and in the bigger cases, they're picking from at the Mohegan Sun Arena, which is a, a full arena. Uh, so <clears throat> it was definitely tighter than that. Uh, but it was, a, it was appropriately distant. So how did the voir dire process work there? Or was it, did you have an opportunity to talk freely to the jurors or was it, you know, set questions? No, so we had, the judge was there. Uh, we were all on like, I always call them bingo tables, but they're like those fold up plastic tables. Uh, it was me and my paralegal and my client, all six feet apart, uh, judge and his tip staff. And then on the other table was the defense lawyer and the defendant. Um, so started with normal voir dire like we always would, um, where I would ask questions. Um, the judge was there. Let me take a step back. The judge asked a few questions early on and they raised their hands. Uh, the way Luzerne County has been doing this is that we've been going back to chambers to do a lot of the follow-up questions. Every question was followed up right in this open forum. <clears throat> so he asked a few questions. There were some people who raised their hands and there were some follow-ups with the basic questions the judge asked. But he didn't ask very many. Then he turned it over to us. And, you know, I had probably maybe 20 to 25 uh, voir dire questions, with, which required quite a bit of follow up. Um, there was a lot of COVID questions I wanted to ask that he wouldn't let me ask. Oh, was so, that? And did you address that ahead of time to know which ones you couldn't, yes. couldn't ask? Okay. Yeah, at our uh, voir dire conference, uh, 
there was a fair amount that I wanted to ask. I just couldn't, he wouldn't let me ask. So he basically only let me ask whether or not it was going to be a hardship for anybody to sit during the pandemic. Did uh, the judge give you a rationale for limiting the, the COVID questions? No, there was no rationale. Um, you know, so the, yeah, I just, there was no rationale. It was just, you're not going to ask those questions. How did people respond to the COVID question you did ask? I don't think there was anybody who actually had a hardship with COVID. Uh, although, interestingly enough, I came to find out um, after the verdict was entered, the court had asked, the, and we can get this, but the court had asked the jurors how they felt about everything the court did with regard to COVID precautions and how they felt. And one of the uh, jurors who in my opinion, had written down every single bit of testimony that there could have been. She looked to be so involved and so enthusiastic about this case. She said, I felt horribly uncomfortable during this trial. I haven't left my house since this has happened. I refuse to be around people. I was very uncomfortable. And I'm thinking, you know, where were you during the, the hardship question? But right. if I had got to follow up with more COVID stuff, I probably could have gotten her off. Interesting. Uh, but again, I don't think it affected her judgment because she, I mean, she was as more attentive than anybody. But. Were there any other, uh, you know, feedback or piece of information like you heard that about the way the pandemic or the experience of serving as a juror affected people? No, they, they did not seem to mind that at all. Uh, when the judge asked how the, how the court had done with the pandemic related precautions, they said that I don't even think any of them raised their hand, meaning they just felt comfortable. They were fine with it. How did you feel about it? Like, you know, having gone through the whole process, did you feel safe or did you feel there were some areas that maybe could have been, you know, a little bit more safer or, or was it good? Know, I, I, my personality through this whole pandemic is I feel, I feel safe if I have my mask on, there's plenty of hand sanitizer everywhere. Um, people that I'm talking to are also wearing masks, keeping their distance. Um, so personally, I never really felt unsafe uh, just because, the masks were so encouraged. Everybody had masks on. The witness uh, was in plexiglass. Uh, the judge was very far away as he delivered his rulings. Defense counsel was six feet away from me. Uh, we both pretty much had our masks on the whole time. So I didn't really feel uncomfortable, no. Um, you feel a little claustrophobic uh, trying a case with a mask on the whole time. I mean, thank God when we asked our questions, I was able to take it off. Um, Did you get, so that's interesting. Okay. So a, what was the, what was the judge's rule as far as, you know, who had to wear their masks in the courtroom and when they had to wear them? The, the juries, the jury had to wear a mask. Everybody had to wear masks. The only times masks were allowed to be taken off as I could see it at least was the judge never had his on when he was on, on the bench, which is fine. He was really away from everybody. And I think it would also have been difficult to hear him had he had his mask on. Uh, we were allowed to take our masks on anytime we had to speak into the microphone to, to talk to the judge, which we were a good 15, 20 feet away from him. Uh, jurors obviously were mandated to wear fast, their masks or face masks. Uh, and when we weren't speaking, we were supposed to have the masks on. When we then were able to cross-examine or do direct, we stood at a podium that was kind of in the middle of the room, away, uh, far enough away from defense counsel, uh, at least 15 feet away from the jury box, uh, where we were allowed to take our masks off to ask questions. The witness had to take their mask off because they wanted the jury to see their facial expressions and judge credibility, uh, but they were literally encased in plexiglass. Um, and, and there was a judge's tip staff that cleaned off the mic and cleaned off the area before they before they exchanged witnesses. So in between each witness, they would clean the, the witness box and the mic out, so to yes. speak. Yeah, I mean, if I was a witness, I probably would have brought my own <laughs> sanitizing equipment. I don't know how perfect that sanitization was, um, but they were using Clorox wipes and doing all that. I mean, I wouldn't have been shocked if another courtroom said in between every witness we're taking five minutes to actually have the janitorial staff come up and do something different. Right. Uh, and in fact, I think even the juror who had felt uncomfortable throughout the whole trial had made reference to that saying, I didn't know if you guys were doing a good enough job cleaning the witness stand. 
What did you wear for a mask? Uh, I just wore a black mask, kind of the Biden mask. That's what I wanted to call it. Uh, it looked uh, it looked nondescript enough. It didn't draw any excess attention to me. Uh, you know, it matched nicely with a navy blue suit, so I figured that would work. Yeah. So I, I I've um, heard a lot of people debating about you know what's the ideal type of mask to wear during a jury trial during the pandemic, and I've heard people talking a lot about uh, wearing. Have you ever seen the clear masks? Yeah. What What is your thought on on whether that would be you mean like a, the face shield? No, no. Oh. Like literally the face mask, where like there's like almost a plastic piece where you could actually see the person's mouth to some extent. I haven't seen that yet, um, but I what I mean, I, I just wear a pretty basic black mask. And again, because we were going to be, we were going to be taking it off when we spoke, so. And what yeah. did you do in that regard? Did you just pull it down or did you take it off entirely? No, I, I, I took it off completely. I mean, we were, I was far enough away from everybody. And just the way I argue and talk, I'm very expressive. And if I had anything attached to me, it would have driven me crazy. Gotcha. Um, the one thing I, I kind of liked, honestly, was uh, having the mask on to be able to look at the jury and even talk to my paralegal where they weren't able to like read my lips and figure out what I was doing. It's kind of like the way the NFL coaches don't have to cover their mouth anymore when they, when they talk about plays. So right. I, I guess it had its advantages, but my ears and felt like they were about to fall off at the end of each day. How was the uh, juror compliance with the masks? They were great. I mean, they were either wearing a face mask shield uh, or a mask the whole time. And were there, in the jury selection, was there any, um, whether it, maybe it wasn't specific uh, health issues for, for COVID, but were there any hardships due to sort of collaterally related to say the economy, you know, I'm a single income household, I, you know, we depend on me because my husband or spouse isn't working right now kind of stuff? There, you know, I think there was one or two in jury selection that got off for that. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't um, it wasn't as predominant as I would have thought, but certainly they had to be thinking that. I mean, my, my biggest worry, frankly, if to ever even try a, a major trial during the pandemic, would be to say this this jury pool hasn't worked in you know, especially if we were trying in August or July. They haven't worked potentially in four months, and now we're going to ask them, you know, to hear a motor vehicle case about back injuries for three days which they're not getting paid for. Right. I thought, I, I mean, I was concerned about that. And, I, and I'm, I still believe that had, you know, that affects their judgment. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I, but nobody brought it up and no one tried to get off for it, which I figured, again, that would have been a guarantee way for somebody to try to get off, but they didn't. Was there a particular COVID related voir dire question you wanted to ask that you couldn't? Yeah, what I wanted to ask was, and I ended up bringing it up during my closing. So the way my thing is, if you watch the news and, and you're, you're up to date on all this, you can't deny the fact that hundreds of thousands of people around the, the world are losing their lives to this dreadful disease, right? And here we are talking about, really, I mean, back, soft tissue back injuries and that someone deserves money for it. So I wanted to try to interweave something into voir dire to ask, you know, does someone, is someone, the fact that we're literally losing lives on a day-to-day -day basis because of this pandemic, is there anybody who just really doesn't feel it's worth the time and effort and can do the justice to our clients when we're asking for money damages, which is what we're asking for, for back injuries? This is a non-life-threatening case. Is there anybody here who, based on everything that's going on, wouldn't be able to award money in a case like this. And I had variations on that question. Uh, and he just, the judge would not let me ask any of it. So I mean, I'll jump ahead a little bit here during my closing, how I felt I was able to, to kind of address that um, was to say in closing, I said, ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand from my position and even my client's position, how incredibly difficult it is to sit in front of eight jurors when we know that people are literally losing their lives on a day-to-day -day basis around the country and the globe because of this dreadful pandemic. In this case, we are very well aware it does not involve catastrophic or life-threatening injuries. 
So we appreciate the awkwardness that there is in this courtroom for us to be asking you all to give money damages for what would be viewed as a minor situation in light of everything that's going on. So we very much get that it is not lost on us. But right now, this case has been sitting around for four years. We've been ordered by the court to come in here and try this case. And there's no way not to try it. And my client's been waiting for four years to get an award. And we ask that you don't hold that against her when awarding her for, for these injuries. So that was kind of the way I tried to, to bring that back in. Uh, the question that I basically wanted to ask during jury selection. Uh, I think that's, I, I think that's great. And, and it's so important to be mindful of the present circumstances with whatever case you're trying, whenever you're trying it, were there any other, um, you know, ways in which you factored in or approached the trial differently or uniquely in light of it being the pandemic? So the thing that, and I've seen a lot of listserv posts on this, um, and, and I'm very well aware of this, that in a case like this, especially during the pandemic, you cannot be looked at as the person who's overreaching and really wasting their time in, in, a, in a time period where nobody wants to be there. I, mean, I don't care who says, oh, I'm looking forward to getting out of the house to see a jury trial. They do not want to be there. So I, I tried to make it, you know, I tried to give it my best effort to really try to impart to the jury that I was not trying to waste their time, nor was my client. So one of the ways I tried to do that was we had, this case was a rear end accident, which the defendant who had been driving for a month on her own uh, without a license, she was 17 when it happened, should have admitted liability. My lady kind of stopped a little abruptly at a yield sign and this girl hits her from behind. She kept a car length of distance. She clearly ran under her. There was no issue on liability. She should have conceded it. She didn't. And she wanted to say, well, it's, it's partially your client to blame as well. And the insurance company went along with that. And I'm not sure why they did. I, maybe just to come, you know, water down the damages, but they went along with it and that's fine. So the way I tried to impart to the jury that it's not us that are keeping you here, it's, it's the defense, was to say uh, an opening. And I took a shot on this again. I, I don't know if it, if it worked or not. Uh, but I said, ladies and gentlemen, I very much get the idea that you don't want to be here. Frankly, I don't really want to be here. My client doesn't want to be here. This is a very difficult time to be trying a case. But we're here because the defendant will not accept responsibility for clearly rear-ending my client. That's what she did. She did it. And she won't accept fault for it. And that's one of the main reasons we're here. I said, the other reason we're here is because you have two defense experts you'll hear from that were paid by the defense who have said, they disagree with all of the treating doctors in this case. That's why, that's why we're here. So I, I tried to, again, make it the idea that I'm going to get in and out, which I, which I did. I mean, I, I really tried to keep it short. And that the reason we're here is for, is because, you know, the defense is really wasting your time on, you know, stuff they should be conceding. And then I really tried to work that again, when the judge granted a directed verdict on liability, it, it was, it was silly that they concede that they didn't concede liability. They should have. We wasted a day and a half on liability. So in my closing, I said, remember, ladies and gentlemen, I told you one of the reasons we were here was because the defense would not accept fault. Well, the judge has taken that away from you. You don't even have to address it. He's ruled on it as a matter of law that she was at fault. So we wasted a day and a half of your time in this courtroom because of something the defense should have just admitted to. Again, trying to impart to the jurors that it's not us that are, that are keeping you here. It's the defense. Yeah, I, I think that's great. And was really wise of you to stress the importance of not wasting people's time, you know, of all times during the pandemic when they're in a room taking extra risks that they otherwise wouldn't have. Did you lead with that in opening? Was that kind of the, your starting point uh, yes. about... You know that I, you know, we don't want to be here. We didn't want to, have to be here. We're here because they're not taking responsibility. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, and, and that's the kind of the fun thing about trying a smaller case is you can take different shots, different things that you're not as maybe brave to do in a, a bigger med mal case where there's a hundred different things going on. I just came right out with it before I thanked anybody or did anything. I just said, I know you don't want to be here. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't want to, I don't want to be here. <laughs> 
my Did client doesn't want a beer. And so I just try to, you know, try to do something a little bit different uh, in kind of a weird time to be trying a case. Jamie, did you get to talk to any of the jurors afterwards to get, I mean, I know you mentioned the one person's take on that they were uncomfortable with the process, but, you know, did you hear anybody else's take on, on how it affected them, if at all? No, uh, I don't think the judge wanted that to happen. Um, as soon as they gave their verdict, uh, they, uh, the judge just asked that general question about, is anybody, did anybody feel uncomfortable? How do you think we as a court did? Um, and then a lot of times, you know, the judges will say, why don't you stick around? The lawyers may want to ask you some questions. He didn't even give that opening. I mean, we, we, had, we had closed at about 12 o'clock on Wednesday. They deliberated, asked questions, and they didn't get done until four on deliberations. And you could just tell they had no interest in it. And the judge wasn't even, I don't even think he would have allowed it. So they just walked right back out of the jury room and I didn't see any one of them. Yeah. And I didn't get a chance to talk to any of them, which is unfortunate because I would have been dying to know how on earth they came to the verdict that they came to. Got it. Got it. Um, Jamie, you had uh, mentioned a little bit ago, all the discussion on the, the list serves, the lawyer list serves about, you know, thoughts on trying a case during the pandemic. But the fact of the matter is that 99% of those people have never tried a case during the pandemic. So having been one of the rare few that was actually in the trenches with a jury trial during the pandemic, having gone through the whole process, I mean, what, uh, was there anything that surprised you or you had a change of thought about or advice you would give to people who were maybe getting ready for a trial during the pandemic of things to keep in mind that maybe weren't super apparent to you as, as you went into this? You know, I'll tell you, I think there's more normalcy than you think. We, you know, especially when we were all in quarantine, I think everybody was scared of their own shadow. I mean, think about the anxiety attack we all had going to the grocery store the first time, right? But haven't we all gotten a little bit more used to going out in public as long as we wear our mask, talking to people socially distant. Uh, I mean, we, we behave differently now, you know, than we did six months ago. And we behave differently than we did during the quarantine. I mean, everybody was petrified during those first few months. I don't care who you were. I think, think you'll, be you'll be shocked and surprised as to how much more normal it is than you have it built up in your mind that it's gonna be this unbelievably cold, not like a normal jury trial experience. I think it's more normal than you think. Once you get by, you know, the jury selection and the spacing and the distancing and everything else, you're trying your case, you're trying your case. The facts still are the facts. You're still closing, you're still opening, you're still giving direct examination. Um, you know, the only thing that's different is what's potentially on people's minds. I mean, I think, there's probably more, there's probably a lot of jurors that are looking forward to the experience because it is something different. But I think you have to keep in mind that a lot of jurors are not pleased to be there, probably more so than they, I and mean, we always know jurors aren't excited to be there. They're probably the least excited ever at this point to be at a jury trial. So I think it's not so much thinking about practicalities. I think it's, it's a little easier than you think. I think what you really need to keep in mind is the mindset on the jury. And I think, again, I, I, it's hard to say if it worked or not because we had such a lopsided verdict. I could talk about it if you want. But I think, I think what we did was correct. So if you, if you think you're going to try that case like you would normally, you're, I mean, you're going to get a terrible verdict and you're just not, no one's going to appreciate what, you're, what anybody's going through because of what's actually going on in the world. You need to hit it head on that, you know, this is not a life-threatening case. It's not catastrophic. It's not someone you know going to lose their life and we recognize that this is awkward to try this in a time when so many people are having such bad luck i think if you don't recognize that you definitely do a disservice to your client uh, i think you have to be as short and and quick and to the point as possible i know that's very difficult in a malpractice case i mean we all try to streamline it as much as we can but experts are experts and you need as many as you do um, but I think for these smaller cases, you need to be extremely reasonable in your approach more than you ever were before, um, you know, and, and, and see how you do. I mean, 
I'll tell you right now, in my, and I'll talk about the verdict here because I think this shows that we, we did what we needed to do in terms of convincing them that this was an ongoing injury. So this is, this is and, we, and this is subject to a post-trial motion coming up next week. Yeah. So, so my lady was injured four years ago. In the four years from the date of the accident, she had had all the treatment that I talked about, you know, 80 chiropractic visits, about 50 physical therapy visits, three injections. So there's plenty of treatment there. It wasn't a rub of life. I mean, this is something that required treatment. Their experts said all it was was a cervical sprain and strain, and she'd be recovered in one to two months. So if you believe their expert, this is a case that you award, because there was no past medicals. Yeah. There was literally no past hard numbers. It was a pain and suffering and future medical damage case. So if you believe their expert and believe their side, you would give zero in pain and suffering, and you'd probably give, you'd give zero uh, really for everything because there's no past medical bills. In Bucks County, if you think it's a cervical sprain and strain, you're giving zero across the board. Well, turns out that we try the case and we close, and ap after we're done closing, the jurors ask questions and they wanna know what the medical bills are in the future. They want us to give the testimony to them again of my doctor who set forth all this future medical care, you know, physical therapy, injections, medicines, and whatnot. Jamie, did, did you put a price in for the future medical care? We put them in ranges. So okay. zero if they don't use it, up to 8,000 if they use the care. Uh, it's really, it's a, it's a good way to do it. It gives them a range to go on as to how they, you know, where they believe things should fall. So, you know, we don't, we don't ram a number down their throat. We say, you give what you believe the person's entitled to. You, what, what treatment do you think they need in the future? So uh, they ask for future medical bills again, and that would put any plaintiff in a good mood to think, well, here we are four years after the accident, they're asking about the futures. We got them. So their verdict comes back, and the first line is for future medical bills, which they award $17,000 of future medicals. Now, that's not great, but in a weird little small soft tissue case, they're at least acknowledging that four years after accident, this She's person is still injured and still needs treatment into the future. And then the rest of the verdict for past, present, and future pain and suffering, past, present, and future loss of enjoyment of life, loss of enjoyment, uh, you know, things that brought your pleasure, zero in every other category. Really? So, I mean, I've tried cases where they've given the past medical bills and zero in pain and suffering. Yeah. But I've never, ever tried a case where they awarded future medical bills four years after an accident, which clearly acknowledges, hey, this lady's still hurt. This is, this is a serious deal. And then they give zero in pain and suffering. Yeah, I was blown away, um, and I believe it's it's strongly against the weight of the evidence. I mean, it's, that's the argument we're going to make next week. Well, how could it not be? Because they've now said that that future medical care was only caused as a result of the Correct. defendant's negligence. So how does all of those other non-economic components not directly tie with that to some degree? It, it has to. And, and, and then the judge asked us after, he said, what do you guys think of the verdict? I said, bewilderment. I mean, I said, Judge, just what I said to you, I said, I've tried a lot of cases and, I, and I've seen where, you know, you may get zero in pain and suffering and they give you whatever, 5,000 in past medicals in a smaller case. I get that. But to acknowledge that she's still injured and give nothing in the, uh, on pain and suffering when you're rewarding in the future, four years later, I, that doesn't even make sense to me. And, and he said, uh, exact quote, not an uncommon verdict for a Bucks County jury. <laughs> I said... I go, it's hard for me to tell whether or not my stuff worked. But again, I think it did work because we got them to, you know, buy that she was still injury, injured and needed care. Yeah. Uh, the, the verdict was just lopsided. So, but. What do you think about uh, once all the post-trial and appellate issues get resolved, reaching out to any of the jurors to see what their oh, rationale I will. was? I, I will. I'm, I'm definitely going to. Uh, yeah. I'm very curious. So, yeah, it left me, you know, you know how it is. You get into these cases and you know it's a small case. And that's just, it just is. But once you get in there and you start, you know, doing everything you're supposed to be doing and you're in the battle and then they're asking about future medicals, you say, hey, maybe this is one that gets knocked out of the park that you never thought would be. And then <laughs> the verdict comes back and it is what it is. But. Yeah. And, and you know it can happen, but you also know the, yeah, the 
the random nature of the juries and you have no clue really, despite all your hard work and voir dire, who exactly you got on that panel. Right. So, so last question I wanted to talk to you about. Um, so you tried a case in a court system that was willing to start trying cases again. Um, I'm here in Allegheny County and they're making uh, steps. They're taking steps to get trials up and running again. They're actually going to start doing them in the David Lawrence Convention Center, okay. which I think is great. Um, but it's taken some time to get there. And, and I think there are other court systems out there that are still not trying cases and probably not going to until 2021 for some reason. And I guess my question to you was, as far as your observation of the court system in Bucks County, I mean, does it seem to you like jury trials should, to, at least to some degree, be able to resume sooner, uh, sooner than later in other counties? I think, you know, I, I probably can't comment completely accurate on that just because Allegheny is pretty, uh, is, is more of a metropolitan type area, even though it's Pittsburgh, I always still think it's a little bit more homey uh, than say Philly. I mean, Philly really, I think has some, some true challenges in dealing with the, the size of the jury pool and the coordination that they need to do to pull a jury trial off. So, you know, taking those counties out of it, which I don't, I just don't know with the size of those metropolitan areas, if they can logistically do it the way they should be able to. But what I saw happen in, in, in Bucks County, and let's face it, that's, that's the majority of counties in Pennsylvania. I mean, Philadelphia and Allegheny are the outliers. I mean, the majority are Luzerne, Lackawanna, Bucks, Pike, Columbia. Um, I really don't see any good reason why the jury trials should be pushed off because, number one, who knows how long this is going to last. I mean, I, I think everybody kept saying, this is the new normal, this is the new normal, and I think it is for a little while. So we can't put our practices and, and, and people's rights to compensation uh, on hold for two years uh, it's, that would be crazy. And I think, again, you're going to try a case in a weird environment, right? But again, who's to say in two years, there's not some other, hopefully, God forbid, not another pandemic, but another a financial crisis. I mean, in 2008, everybody lost their jobs. Banks were, you know, crushing down. We didn't stop jury trials because there was bad things going on in the world. Uh, th those are just challenges as to how you try to argue them. But to logistically pull them off, there's no reason why they can't be pulled off with all the appropriate measures. The one thing they didn't do in this, in this jury trial, which um, they probably should have done, was take temperatures of everybody walking through every day. I mean, I know our courthouse is adamant on temperature checks. Uh, they didn't do that. Um, you know, maybe, their, some of their, uh, maybe some of their sanitation could be sharpened up. But if you do things right and you're just super diligent, there's no reason why you can't try cases. Um, it's just, just a challenge for the lawyers in terms of crumbing up with crafty arguments to get people's, uh, the reaction that they're looking for. Yeah, and it seems like the most surprising takeaway uh, that you shared, I mean, you had all those really great ideas about you know, streamlining the trial and different ways to you know, level and sort of be frank with the jury but the big takeaway that a lot of people, it seems like, would be surprised by is how normal it and regular it was to try a case, even despite the masks and the, and the, you know, the current times. Right. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, uh, Jamie, that's uh, all super insightful, super helpful. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing your experience uh, with me uh, on, uh, on my channel. Um, you know, before we sign off, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, talk to you either about you know, more questions about what it's like to try a case or to have you represent them. What's the best way for people to, to connect with you? Sure. Uh, our main offices are in Wilkes-Barre, uh, Pennsylvania. That's Luzerne County. Uh, the firm's called Anzalone Law Offices, LLC. And uh, again, my name is Jamie Anzalone. And my email, if you ever want to get a hold of me, that's probably the easiest way. It's Jamie, J-A-M-I-E dot Anzalone at AnzaloneLaw.com. Uh, we also have a Facebook page, Instagram, all that good social media stuff. So you can private message us or, you know, just uh, go on our website. Uh, there's submission forms on the website uh, and that gets an email really to the whole group. Um, yeah. And then our office phone number is 570-825-2719. And again, we handle 
all types of personal injury. Uh, we have a commercial and a state department as well, uh, but I'm involved only in the personal injury side of it. Awesome. Well, Jamie, thanks so much, man. Really appreciate it. And thanks everybody to listening to the Persuasive Lawyer.